Yeah, when I went into this, I was thinking, okay, I kind of knew that there was going to be this this collision course thing between the the submarine and the and the Lusitania, because the the captain of the ship, the captain of the submarine, as did all submarine captains, had kept a, a meticulous uh, war log um, detailing everything that happened from the moment he left Germany to the time he returned. So I, I knew all of all of that, um, and and it made an you know an obvious narrative thing to have the Lusitania and the submarine converging. But in the course of researching uh, this, I, I came across all this in interesting information about Schrieger. I mean, I wanted him to be this classic villain. You know, that's going into it. I wanted him, you know, okay, I would love a monocle, you know? <laughs> you know, I, I'd, love a, I'd love a monocle like a scar, you know, that kind of thing. And, you know, what I got was this nice guy, 30-year-old guy, handsome, you know, charismatic, beloved by his crew, well-liked throughout the submarine service, and... One of his friends, a fellow submarine commander, said of him at one point, he said, you know, he couldn't hurt a fly. He couldn't hurt a fly. This is after the war, you know. So, so it's just, yeah. I've opened the book to this um, room 40 right. cadence. <clears throat> and this is, is this the positioning? This is yes. the report on the positioning. Yeah, one of the remarkable things about the, 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 the story, when, as I started getting into reading about it, I, I, mean, I, I got to say, I was not... I came to the Lusitania sort of reluctantly. You did? I had, I had like nothing else on my plate. <laughs> but I had this, this, this maritime tick, you know, and, and I, I was just interested in the Lusitania. And I, I don't know, I started reading about it and I started getting more. And then I did a, my first like exploratory archival trip and that's what really sort of cemented it. But, but one of the things that really surprised me was the, <clears throat> the role of this super secret uh, uh, operation within the Admiralty called Room 40. Room 40 was established very early in the war to take advantage of three nearly miraculous events that had occurred, which was on three different occasions, again, very early in the war, the British came into possession of Germany's three main code books governing almost all of their wireless transmissions, both naval and diplomatic. And so, the, the, so Churchill um, and a handful of others got together and formed Room 40, which was to take advantage of these captured code books and use them to read wireless messages intercepted from the German Navy. And they became very, very adept at this. And one of the mysteries, well, not, not mystery, one of the most interesting things about the saga is that U-20, the submarine, um, you know, sent wireless messages and received wireless messages. And so from the very beginning, this room, room 40, knew exactly what the submarine's orders were, knew exactly where it was supposed to end up on patrol, and during its first, this is what you're looking at, during its first 24 hours at sea, its wireless operator sent 14 position reports, which the British in room 40 duly intercepted and decoded. So they knew exactly where the submarine was for the first 24 hours. So that's the, the chapter you're looking at. Yeah, I mean, in, in the book, it's at 2 a.m., the exact location, 4 a.m., 6 a.m., right. 8 a.m., and then you say the report cease. Where was all this information for you to find it? Uh, it's all in the intercept. Um, in, in, the United, in the archives, National Archives of the United Kingdom, they have... I was delighted to find these vast caches of information. They have all the decoded intercepts. Really? And those are all, all there in their, in their files. Just really, really tremendous stuff. And see, the, the thing about also about German submarine commanders what they, was that they were, they were said to be, quote, unquote, garrulous. That is, to, that is to say, they liked using their wireless. They liked chatting over the, over the they did. They liked chatting over the wireless. And partly, I, I mean, I have, to, I have to think that part of it might, might be because they knew that Ultimately, they were going to be dealing with this, 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 this amazing loneliness, and so it was kind of comforting to be able to send. But they had no clue that, that, that somebody was listening. They had no idea. And not only did they have no idea then, they had no idea through most of the war. The German Navy was so arrogant as to believe that their codes would never be broken. It's just extraordinary, yeah, yeah, isn't it? Yeah. How hard was that code to break? What, what kind of information did you well, well, find the, about the code, that? Well, I mean, once you have the code book. Um, no, yeah. <laughs> no, no, but... So, but but, but, no, but, but um, it, there, there are two elements to this. There's a code book, which is key, and that consists of essentially three-letter groups, including a three-letter group for, of all things, Nantucket. 
um, which sort of suggests a certain aspiration, you know, on the, on the, I'm not part of the German Navy. But the code, the, the, when the Germans put their messages in code, they used the code book primarily uh, as the first step, and then they would uh, further scramble it using a cipher. So there was a lot of code breaking that did have to go on, even though they, not code breaking, but deciphering. There's a difference in crypt, cryptographic circles, you know. Um, so, but, but, but it was relatively easy to break that cipher because of how regimented the German Navy was in communications with its ships. Um, I don't want to bore anybody with the details of this, but essentially if you signal the same light ship every night at 6 p.m., you're going to eventually catch on that this is the light ship and it's 6 p.m. and this message and you know what it's saying. So that through that process, they were able to become very adept, not only at, at uh, deciphering, but of course using the code book to break the codes.